Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, May 20th, and we will hear planning for healthier communities. Consider a nurse. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the questions box located in your GoToWebinar tool panel, and I will do my best to help with those tech questions. For content questions related to our presentation, you can again just type those in the questions box, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation in our designated Q&A period. I will ask that uh, you let me know which panelists you would like to answer the question. That just helps me when we're filtering and going through all of those questions. So again, just type them in that questions box. Coming up next on your screen is a list of our sponsoring APA chapters and divisions for 2022. Thanks to all those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to members. Today, we are sponsored by the Florida chapter of APA. So thanks to you all for uh, joining us this year and for hosting today's unique session. We appreciate it. Next, uh, today's session is worth one and a half CM credits, so you can log those credits by heading over to planning.org, log into your My APA account. From there, you can either search by today's title or event number, both of which can be found on our website, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. If you're on social media, be sure to like us on Facebook. That's where I post important or timely information like date or time changes and i also give everyone a heads up when new sessions are available for you to register for and a weekly notice of uh, who's on tap for friday and we record all of our sessions and we post them onto our youtube channel so be sure to click the red button and subscribe so that you get notified when a new session is available for you to view if you pop on over there to youtube just uh, type in planning webcast in the search field and we'll pop up along with our well over 400 recordings which are always available for you to view for free so with that, again, type your questions in the questions box that you have for our panelists. Please indicate who you'd like to answer that question. Remember to log those CM credits. And as always, head over to ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast to register for all of our upcoming Friday sessions. With that, I am going to turn it over to Alex McGee with APA Florida, who is uh, kicking things off here for <laughs> us. So all right. Thank you, Alex, Christine. Alex, I just turn those controls over to you. I'm working on it. Can you Looks see good. it? Perfect. All right, great. Well, I want to thank everybody who is joining us today on this beautiful Friday afternoon. At least it's beautiful in Tallahassee, so hopefully it's beautiful in your neighborhood. This webinar is a collaboration between APA Florida AARP Florida, and the Nurses on Board Coalition. And the webinar is going to focus on the opportunity for you to better link the health perspective and local planning efforts through the recruitment and uses of nurses as members of your local boards and committees. So your speakers today, I just want to quickly introduce. We have uh, myself. I'm the Executive Director of APA Florida. We then have Laura Cantwell, who is the Associate State Director of Adv Advocacy and Outreach for AARP Florida. We have Lori Benson, who's the Executive Director of the Nurses on Boards Coalition. And then we have Paul Lewis with the City of Orlando. He's their Chief Planning Manager. And Susan Poplin, who's a Principal Planner with the Tallahassee Leon County Planning Department. So I just want to quickly say what we're each going to be covering. I'm going to talk about how. Um, APA Florida got involved in this coalition. Laura is going to talk about the work that ARP Florida is doing with um, age-friendly communities and with trying to link um, health and planning. Lori Benson is going to talk about the Nurses on Boards Coalition and she's going to be providing information on how that organization can help you find volunteer nurses to serve on your boards and your committees and help introduce the health perspective into those planning discussions. 
And then Paul and Susan are each going to discuss a real life case study of how they've been able to incorporate and use nurses within some of their planning efforts in their local communities. So, um, as I said, I'm going to start off with how we got involved. So, um, you know, planners have been dealing with the issue of health and its link to planning for many years. Some of the things that APA Florida as an organization has been doing over the years includes uh, supporting legislation such as uh, using state transportation dollars for multi-use trails, um, a healthy food financing initiative that was in the legislature in 2016. We have over the years provided continuing education on health related issues at our annual conferences and also at the section level. As you know, we have um, 12 sections within Florida who provide uh, continuing education at the local level. We've included panels on health and planning at our annual public policy workshop. And we also have a microsite on our overall website that's called um, Livable Florida. And we have a number of issues that we have discussed and provided resources on. And one of those is a Healthy by Design resource page. So I encourage you guys, if you haven't seen, um, if you're outside of Florida and you haven't looked at it, or if you're in Florida and you haven't looked at it yet, go to our website and go look at the Livable Florida microsite. So in 2016, the National Office of APA, which around that time had identified health and planning as a key national issue, received money from the Division of Community Health in the Center for Disease Control. And this actually, this funding was the third stage of an overall project that APA had been working on for the previous couple of years with the CDC. The first two stages focused on funding for actual planning projects at the local community level that would incorporate health in planning. But um, this particular um, stage was focused on a broader scale and it was looking to have uh, APA state chapters focus over a six month period on the challenges and opportunities to create cross-sector partnerships with local public health professionals. And the goal was to better integrate planning and public health. And in this overall project, there were three deliverables that National was requiring. You had to do an assessment of health and planning. You had to host a round table with stakeholders and you had to identify the next steps for chapters and stakeholders to actually take. So we were, we were awarded one of the grants in 2017, and our goal um, was to come up with a collaborative effort to enhance and encourage the cross-sectional relationships. We wanted to come up with some end product that would be sustainable, and we wanted to come up with a product that we could easily distribute and that people could easily access. And so we started with um, uh, creating a task force to oversee the project. That was our first step. And that task force was organized as a multi-jurisdictional team. We were trying to get different sectors that we thought were important to this effort to be represented. So we included people from the planning field, from health, from environmental, from the aging population, from food systems, and from transportations. And not only were these members selected based on their professional representation, but we also tried to ensure that we had a geographically diverse representation of Florida. And the task force met initially for a day to discuss ways to better integrate the two professions, how to create interest in the project, uh, what we should do, what we must do, and what we shouldn't do as part of this project. And in the end, the consensus, which was based on the project goals that I had outlined earlier, um, the consensus was that what we wanted to do was to create a web-based platform that would provide resources to both planners and health professionals 
to help them link the two disciplines together. So we also, at that time, just determined that we wanted to send out a survey so we could figure out exactly where there were ongoing interactions already within Florida. So we sent a survey to our full APA Florida membership and we sent it to a database that the task force created and it was a database of um, health professionals. A lot of them were health planning council members or representatives that were in Florida. And we asked a number of, of questions. And I'm just gonna show you like four of the questions that were included. This question obviously was asking the percentage of planners that interact with public health officials in their line of work. And you can see about a third of the people who responded said, yeah, we interact with our health professionals and two thirds said no. So we asked the same question kind of of the health officials, how many of you interact with planners in your line of work? And again, it was about a third said yes and two thirds said no. We were also interested in trying to figure out whether the political climate at the local level and the communities that these um, respondents were working, whether they thought that there was interest in guiding people towards healthier communities. And it was, it's hopefully not surprising that over 71% of the planners thought, yes, there is political will in our communities to try to improve and incorporate healthy initiatives. And we asked the same thing of the health officials and they were actually uh, slightly higher. 83% said, yes, they thought there was political will to do it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So the survey's results clearly showed that there was an existing disconnect between planners and health professionals, but that both disciplines believed that creating healthier communities was supported politically. So the task force believed that these results supported their idea of creating the website and that this would be a useful tool for both um, disciplines. So the next step that we did in this process was to host a roundtable of both professional, health professionals and planners. And the goal was to uh, really help us flesh out what would be meaningful content for that website. How could we um, get the content? How could we fund the content? And um, kind of came up with exercises to help us generate some content at the very beginning. And so in the fall of 2017, about six months after we started the project, the Plan for Healthy Florida website was launched. And there is a, uh, you can see a slide of the homepage of it. Uh, since that time, we've used the services of an intern to update and maintain the site. The address is right there on the screen. I really encourage you all to check it out. We have resources, we have glossary, we put an event up, we do a professional spotlight of either a planner or a health professional who's working to try to link uh, planning and, and health together. Um, if you have any resources or content you think would be appropriate to add, please feel free to contact me. Uh, we're always happy to try to expand what we have on um, this website. But around the same time that we were doing this work, uh, APA Florida began a collaboration with AARP, really through the help of our next speaker, Laura Cantwell. The more that Laura and I talked, the more we realized how closely some of AARP's initiatives, such as their age-friendly communities effort, really aligned with our organizational goals. And during one of those last discussions, um, it was in the fall of last year, Laura talked about this new pilot project they were doing with the Nurses on Board Coalition to try to promote using nurses as volunteer members of local boards and committees to better bring the health perspective to those, dis to those discussions. And I really saw this, I got really excited. I saw this as a great way to help us move this Plan for Healthy Florida effort to the next level. And I was really excited to have APA Florida become part of this collaborative effort. So I'm gonna turn it over to Laura now to have you talk to her about 
ARP's interests in these uh, in this effort. So Laura, over to you. Thank you so much, Alex. I appreciate it. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Cantwell, and I am so excited to be here today. I am with AARP Florida, and I lead the work that we're doing for Florida around our livable communities and have been so fortunate to work with Alex throughout the years and uh, really see how we can collaborate more. So I'm excited to talk to you today about how health is really fitting into our livable community work. Next slide. So when we at ARP, one thing we do is a lot of surveys. So kind of to set the stage for the first time in US history, we have entered a place where the number of older adults are projected to outnumber our children. And that really does have some implications for our society as a whole and for communities to really think about. So on the next slide uh, shows some of our recent survey that we've done um, that we see consistently. Every time we do this, we hear over and over that the majority of people want to remain in their home and not just in their home, but they want to stay in their community. You know, we've chosen our community for a reason and we're connected with our neighbors and uh, with our uh, with what with everything in our neighborhood and we want to stay there. So at ARP, we wanted to do a deeper dive to see what features are really important. And in the next slide, we started this by not only surveying older adults, but also looking at all ages. And we find that millennials and baby boomers want similar things, that age isn't really defining us in terms of our preferences and what we're looking for. You know, everybody wants the well-maintained accessible streets. They want to have access to the grocery stores. They want safe parks. They want well-maintained healthcare facilities. So we sat back and thought about, well, what can we do to make sure we're not only preparing for this demographic shift that I mentioned earlier, but we're making our communities holistically more prepared for older adults and for young children as well. And in the next slide, um, we started working on under the broader livable communities umbrella. We started working on an agenda called our age-friendly communities. And an age-friendly community is one that is free from physical and social barriers and is supported by policies, systems, services, products, and technologies that promote health and build and maintain physical and mental capacity across the life course and also enable people, even when experiencing capacity loss, to continue to do the things that they value. And on the right hand side, you see a map with a lot of dots on it and some red states. So in 2012, AARP became the US affiliate for this age-friendly initiative. And we started with 10 communities across the US. As you can see, we are close to nine, close to 700 communities that are engaging in age-friendly efforts. Eight states, that's what the red uh, outlines are states that are looking from a statewide perspective of what they could do. Florida became the fourth state to, to have this designation in 2019. And in Florida, we partnered with the Florida Department of Elder Affairs, who leads that initiative uh, to look at how we can make Florida uh, even better for older adults. So I want to take a minute here and pause and see if we could bring up a poll just to get an idea in the audience of how many of you have an age-friendly community or are living in one. So is your community an age-friendly community? Thank you, Laura. So folks, just go ahead and click your response. Um, to my panelists, I, I don't believe that you have the option to uh, vote. So if you don't see that quick poll, it's because you can't vote. Um, but, <laughs> and uh, if you are on a mobile device, some of our mobile devices uh, sometimes don't jive real well with a quick poll. So if it doesn't pop up for you and you're on a mobile device, don't take it personally. That's why. So I'll give it another second here until we get about 75% of our folks responding. And uh, we'll move on here. Give it another moment. Is your community an age-friendly community? Yes, no, 
I don't know. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close it and share the results um, again to my panelists. I don't believe you can see the results, but all of our attendees can. Uh, you can see here, uh, yes, uh, our community is an age-friendly community. 29% of our attendees uh, have said yes to that. 37% uh, said no, we're not an age-friendly community, and 34% just don't know. So. Uh, our small majority here uh, of attendees is that the community is not age friendly. And then coming in next is, geez, I don't even know. And then uh, lastly is, yes, we are age friendly. So I'm gonna go ahead and hide these results. Uh, and folks, just so you know, we will have a couple more coming through here uh, throughout this presentation, so, so stay tuned. But Laura, I'm gonna turn it back to you now. Great, and uh, that is uh, kind of what I expected to see in the results and exciting for those that are in an age-friendly community. And if you don't know, um, we, you can go to aarp.org slash livable, and that's where this interactive map is that you can click on to see who it, what communities are engaging in this work in your state. And what it means, it means that your highest elected official of a municipality, um, a city or a county has uh, decided to be part of the network. And there is an amazing team of folks that are working um, in the background to make sure that they're hearing from community members first to see you know, what, uh, what's working, what's not working, and then really stepping back and thinking about what can we do to prepare and make our community even better for older adults. So um, in Florida, we have 45 communities uh, that are engaging in this work. Uh, we even have our first health district, which is really exciting. Um, it is not a municipality, but it's a health district that's been in place for about 10 years, and now they're really taking a focus on older adults as well. So if you are in that, I'm not sure, uh, category, please make sure to go to our website. Uh, next slide, please. And the age-friendly work is based around eight domains of livability. So the first section is our built environment, looking at housing, outdoor spaces, uh, buildings, transportation, and then also looking at social participation, health services and community supports, respect and social inclusion, civic participation and employment, and communication and information. And as you can imagine, all of these domains intersect with one another. So they're not neat categories. They all definitely uh, play a role with each other. And then particularly during the pandemic, we have added some more areas that have really shown up uh, as really important. Um, emergency preparedness, particularly here in Florida as well with hurricanes. Um, looking at elder abuse, public safety, and then dementia friendly. We are also working in Florida. The Florida Department of Elder Affairs has an initiative that they've been working on for many years called Dementia Care and Cure Initiative that's really looking at how to also make communities prepared and more accessible for those living with dementia. So all of these domains really play an important role with each other. Um, and in the next slide, I wanted to show an example of how it's really multifaceted and some holistic, some different approaches that we're seeing here in Florida. Uh, the first example I have is of the city of St. Pete. Uh, they're really working on this uh, work from the Parks and Recreation Department, uh, also with other community uh, partners, including uh, the Area Agency on Aging, AARP, um, really looking at what we can do as a community from that perspective. And Miami-Dade County, the county has made a, a pledge that they would like to get all of their municipalities working on age-friendly as well. They have quite a few now, I believe over 14. And this is also where we have the health district that's doing the work. And the next one is in Walton County. Their county health improvement plan is really leading the age-friendly work, which I'll talk about more in just a minute. And then in Cape Canaveral, uh, they have used their resiliency plan as the backbone for their age-friendly work um, and really looking at what they can do for the built environment to make it more walkable, accessible for older adults, um, as well as young kids. Next slide. 
So, and the next one is the Walton County Health Improvement Plan. So a few years ago, ARP partnered with Trust for, well, actually Trust for America's Health led a pilot here that ARP was lucky enough to work with that was funded by the John A. Hartford Foundation. And they worked with 37 of Florida's 67 county health departments to look at what they can do to become uh, more age friendly for older adults. Uh, this was the first in the country. It was really exciting. We saw a lot of integration between the built environment and the health environment and alignment with the age friendly work. And this uh, Walton County becoming age friendly was, uh, a, was a result of this pilot. This pilot is continuing here in Florida. Um, on its second wave and also across the US, we're seeing other states that are engaging in that. Next slide, please. And then I wanted to just take a minute to talk about some examples. Uh, as Alex said, we're really seeing some work um, in our built environment that is uh, focused on health. And the first is with our outdoor spaces and buildings. We have a uh, really good um, publication um, that we developed with 880 Cities that really talks about how we can make our parks and public spaces more accessible for people of all ages. And many, many of those features uh, have a health component to them. So for example, on the right hand side, talking about what can we do to make our parks more uh, walkable, uh, also having exercise equipment, um, I have a picture of the ARP St. Pete Fit Lot. Uh, this was the first in the US. Uh, ARP has now installed these across the United States, but these are really put in place so that when we are bringing the children, grandchildren to the park, there's also a place for adults and older adults to exercise, which has been um, a great place, uh, especially uh, after the, during the pandemic, uh, there have been some exercise classes lab that have been outdoors. Uh, and we're seeing this across all of our state um, and across the United States, more and more innovative ways of adding in exercise equipment in parks. And then also um, community gardens. We, uh, this is another example of a project that happened in Miami-Dade um, where there was a food desert and they, the community came together to build a uh, community garden so that they could address food insecurity and also have intergenerational connectivity. Next slide, please. And then one area we have been really engaged in in Florida and uh, I'm sure across the US has been around transportation. So what can we do um, to really make uh, more active transportation options and safety? And this is an example. I have one of our volunteer leads uh, here in Florida, Ken Reinhardt. Um, is works with the Metropolitan Planning Organization um, with their Citizen Advisory Committee. And they were out with a grant that ARP funded last year um, to paint a site, to paint a roadway to make it safer uh, and to really show where the bike lanes are. So we're doing that kind of work across the state uh, to really look at how we can make our streets safer. Um, we have a lot of uh, volunteers that are engaging in Vision Zero Task Force, uh, Complete Streets Task Force, and then one thing that uh, Ken and his team have been doing for many years now, and uh, we're doing whether it's an age-friendly community or not, uh, is that we've been going out and doing walk audits of our neighborhoods and our communities to see where there might be some gaps in place and things that we can do to make some improvements to make those streets safer. And if you're not familiar with this, ARP just updated our toolkit and it's downloadable. I think we have like 18 pages so you can do one at a time. <laughs> um, if you wanna just focus on an intersection or if you wanna do a uh, uh, focus on your sidewalk, you can pinpoint some areas and then send some feedback uh, to the community. Next slide, please. And then housing is uh, definitely an area that ARP has been working on for many years since we were founded. Uh, universal design has been something that as an organization we have been really focused on. Um, we have worked with uh, UC or Home Fit Guy, with occupational therapist, uh, to look at how we can make our homes safer um, and help prevent falls and also make our home a place that we can stay in for a longer time by making some minor changes. So 
we're really focused on what can be done around universal design um, in terms of retrofitting our homes and also in terms of what features could be in place as we're building new homes. And then uh, affordable housing uh, definitely uh, is something that we're engaging in the age friendly work on across the state and looking at uh, accessory dwelling units and other examples of things that could be done to make uh, to make housing more affordable. And then the next slide, I mentioned earlier about our community challenge grants. This is one way that we're really trying to kickstart some change at the local level. We've been doing it for several years here at ARP where we do smaller grants that can really have big impacts and hopefully result in some changes down the road. And as you can see, there is a huge connection to health and all of this work that's happening. We've had over 102 healthy living programs funded across the US, 428 gardens built, uh, 118 crosswalks improved. And this was uh, before this year, we just finished our challenge grants and we'll be uh, announcing our winners in the next month. But those projects have all really focused on what can we do to make our built environments uh, more uh, accessible and health has played a huge role in all of that work. And then in the next slide, uh, I wanted to make sure to let everybody know that this month, ARP updated our livability index. Um, I know some of you may be familiar with this. When it was first launched, it was unique in the sense that it was the first data set that gave a livability score all the way from your neighborhood to your city, to your county, to your state. So you could really do some, you could put your address to your home and see how your neighborhood compared to the neighborhood next to you. Um, and as you can see, our category scores that we're focused on um, looks at housing, uh, neighborhood, transportation, environment, health, engagement, and opportunity. And you can look at what policies and metrics uh, we're focusing on to make those determinations. Uh, it's all based on national data sets. And as I mentioned, this was just updated. So if you have not seen it, I encourage you to go and check that out. Um, and then uh, finally, I wanted to show you a list of all of our resources that our team at our national office has put together uh, around our age-friendly livable communities work. A lot of those I mentioned today, um, but really looking at things like pop-up placemaking, uh, creating parks and public spaces. Um, we just developed a new handbook for neighborhood improvements. Uh, and then looking at things like rural livability, we get asked that a lot. What can we do as a smaller community? So really some great best practices are included in all of this um, with health being uh, at the forefront of, of a lot of the work. And then finally, I wanted to leave you with our website. I never tell people to subscribe to more e-newsletters or more emails. I know we all get a lot of those right now, but our e-newsletter does uh, give you really great uh, suggestions and examples of what's happening across the U.S. Uh, today, we're going to hear from a couple of our communities and uh, from our partners of those examples. Uh, but uh, I would encourage you to uh, subscribe to that. That's where we do announce our challenge grants when they launch as well. Um, and aarp.org slash livable has the examples of all the materials that I went over today. And now I'm going to turn it over to Lori Benson, who is the executive director of the Nurses on Board uh, Coalition to talk a little bit more about the work that we've been doing um, and what uh, the nurses are doing uh, in this area as well. Thank you so much, Lori. Thank you, Laura and Alex for teeing this conversation up. Well, the first thing I wanna say is thank you to all of you who've taken the time to join us for our program this afternoon. And I'd like to call out Alex McGee and Laura Cantwell for their thought leadership, which has resulted in our very unique and meaningful collaboration. So in terms of our collaboration with AARP Florida, it began a year ago when Laura raised her hand at a national meeting I had attended and said, we'd like to be the first to pilot with the Nurses on Boards Coalition. And then of course, as Alex shared, Laura brought us all together. So thank you for this opportunity. 
I'm Lori Benson, nurse entrepreneur, and privileged to be the executive director of the Nurses on Boards Coalition. In my brief remarks, I will lay the foundation about considering why a nurse can, can help support your work and how to connect with nurses who are interested. So basically, the Nurses on Boards Coalition, Coalition is a resource for all of you as you consider nurses. Let's begin by talking about our objectives for today. Primarily, we want to make sure that you have an overview and awareness of this unique opportunity for APA chapters to include nurses serving on your boards and committees at the intersection of planning and public health. Secondly, leveraging the collaboration of APA Florida, AARP Florida, and NOBC. We know it takes people to accomplish our shared goals. So we're gonna help in terms of building capacity and especially in support of the plan for planners for health goals, which Alex has talked about. And lastly, we just want this to be easy for you to find the right nurse to connect with your work in the communities where they live and work. So those are our objectives. And before we go any further, I would like to ask a poll question so that we know how many of you who've joined us today already have a nurse engaged in your planning work. So please take a moment and respond. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and put that poll up here in just a moment. Thank you. All right, so do any of you have a nurse currently serving on a local board or committee in your community? Yes, no, I don't know. I'll give you all a few moments to uh, answer this question. We'll give it just another moment here. Thanks all for participating in these polling questions. It makes it fun. <laughs> okay, great. I'm gonna go ahead and close up our poll now and share those results. So 61% of you say, no, we don't have a nurse currently serving on a local board or community or committee. 34% uh, don't know and 5% say yes. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and hide those results. And Lori, what do you think about, what do you think about uh, those responses? I think this is wonderful because I identify this as an opportunity. So there are many of you, you've probably come because we're talking about, have you considered a nurse? So, and for those of you that do have nurses already, uh, feel free, my contact information is at the end. We're happy to connect them to resources that we have to support nurses for those of you who already have nurses engaged. Okay, so let's look at our mission alignment. An imperative for successful partnerships and collaborations is that you're aligned at the mission level. And this one could not be a better alignment. So when you look at each of our missions, it's all about community of all ages and improving health. And when you make that integral connection between our shared mission, natural collaboration evolves. So we're very proud to work together toward our shared goals. I thought it would be helpful to take a moment and share our strategy map that the Nurses on Boards Coalition created via virtual strategic planning last year. It was very engaging and we have our strategy map for the next three years from 2022 to 2025. Well, with our mission at the top to improve the health of communities through the service of nurses on boards, we have three key strategies that I wanted to call out. The first is we're going to target board placements where nurses can influence policies and strategies that address the social determinants of health. Laura just talked about the eight domains of livability. They align exactly right on top of the social determinants of health. So we're all speaking that same language. And our, also our emphasis to ensure social justice and equity at the community level. The second strategy is demonstrate the value. You know, why does it make sense? And we're gonna talk about that today. And of course, continue our core work to be a conduit for placements 
to engage nurses on boards and committees, which is exactly what we're doing today. So some of you may be familiar with the Future of Nursing Report 2020-2030. Well, the Nurses on Boards Coalition was actually created as a direct result of the Future of Nursing 2010 report that called on nurses to be educated to lead change. And the name of the report was Leading Change, Advancing Health. It's interesting because at that time, 21 national nursing association leaders came together and they said, what could we do together to improve health in our communities? So that is how the coalition was formed. And now with the recent release of the Future of Nursing 2020-2030 report, charting a path to help achieve health equity, it calls on nursing leaders to engage in communities where they live and work to improve health, promote a culture of health, address the social determinants of health, and achieve in multi-sector groups the, uh, the health equity for all. So I thought you'd be appreciate knowing about that report and that nurses foundationally are leading collectively and individually to make that happen. So why nurses? It's probably not too hard to figure out why nurses. Um, it's interesting because there's 4.2 million nurses in the country, meaning about one out of every hundred people is a nurse. I know everyone listening knows a nurse, but you might not know which nurses are interested in working with you. And conversely, they may not know of your interest in inviting the health perspective. So, and the timing is certainly now for us to work toward these shared goals. So when we think about what skills nurses bring, you'll hear when Paul and Susan share specific examples in Orlando and Tallahassee, real life examples of where these skills come to bear. But I just wanted to say that the competencies, skills, and experiences that nurses learn in practice, in academia, and public health and community roles translate very naturally into board and committee settings. And I've listed some of these here from quality, safety, human resources, certainly strategic planning, and they already know how to work in teams. This multi-sector element is an important way for all of us to leverage these shared skills, interests, and contributions to result in great things, great ideas, and great plans. So there's many nurses across the country that are interested. We have over 23,000 registered in our database, and of those, 15,000 want to serve. So we heard earlier about the assessment that was done in uh, Planners for Health. Well, nurses are skilled in those phases, all the phases of assessment, planning, implementation, evaluation, and they're adept at addressing, which we've talked about now, the social determinants, promoting a culture of health and wellness and achieving health equity. They also provide care to all populations so they know the stakeholders and, and the implications of decisions. They serve a wide variety of patients and families and they see these overarching issues and they care deeply about applying best practices and resources in order to make communities better and healthier for all. So I thought you'd like to see just a list, this is included um, in the materials, of the current national organizations who are members of our board of directors. And as you can see, we have a wide range of practice that's represented that make up our coalition so that we can provide nurses and their members, when you have opportunities, we go right to them. And so we get diverse candidates for your board opportunities. So how do you connect? Well, at this point, we hope you're convinced that it makes sense to, to include nurses. And we are a resource to make that happen. So we put everything together in a one-page summary. So after today, when you walk away and come back to this, everything's in one place for you. We also created, with the help of Alex and Laura, a one-page Find a Nurse form. Well, what is that? We ask you to tell us the name of your board or committee or the group where, you're, where you would like to include a nurse, the mission of that organization or the group, when do you meet? What qualifications are you seeking? Is there any specific skill that is essential or would be most helpful to this group? 
So it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to fill out that form. And then we review it, we send it out to our network, which includes our state leaders. In addition to our member organizations, we have contacts at every state that work with us, our partners and others in the network who have registered in the database and say, I'm interested. We give about three weeks for our nurses to respond because any shorter, they don't have time. Any longer, it gets moved down the agenda. So we found that sweet spot at three weeks. But if you need someone sooner, you tell us, we'll make it happen for you. And then we'll share qualified nurse candidates for your consideration. We just ask that you tell us when you pick a nurse and then uh, we will support them. And that's the beautiful part of this is with AARP and the Nurses on Boards Coalition working together and certainly with APA, will provide support behind the scenes so that they can contribute in the most valuable way. So lastly, this is a snapshot of the one pager, which you will all receive, has a little reminder of the, um, you know, why the nurse and then the link to find a nurse. You can talk to Storm Young, who's on the call, and myself, um, either one of us, reach out to us. We'll talk to you about the opportunity as you're thinking it through and assist you in filling out the form. So at this point, you should have everything you need as you consider a nurse and the Nurses on Boards Coalition will help connect you to the right nurse for the right reasons to make a difference and help you as you plan for healthier communities. Thank you. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Paul Lewis who will talk about how they've incorporated the health nursing perspective into Orlando's health planning efforts. And my contact information is at the end and we'll answer questions. Paul, over to you. And before Thanks. Paul starts, I just wanna say, I just uploaded into the handouts in your GoToWebinar uh, tool panel, uh, the form that Lori just showed a screenshot of um with all of the additional information you can direct download that pdf right now from your GoToWebinar tool panel and of course for those of you that are going to be viewing this session after the fact and uh as a recording and obviously can't access it we will have it on our website ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast all right paul it's all you Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Lori, and, and, and the, what an incredible panel. Uh, and I just want to talk a little bit uh, for the group, uh, some examples of how, we, how we've integrated uh, nurses on our, on our boards, um, and in, also in some of our planning efforts over the last uh, decade or so. Um, so you'll remember the pictures you're seeing on this, co on this cover slide. I'll talk a little bit more about them in a couple minutes. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give you a little bit of, uh, of uh, context for the city of Orlando, um, and uh, oh, I should back up and say, for those that don't know me out in the world, uh, I've been with the city of Orlando for about 35 years. Uh, I am the chief planning manager with the city, and I primarily do long range plans and also special plans for the city. So. Um, so Orlando is rapidly growing. We had uh, we went over a little bit over 300,000 uh, in the 2020 uh, census. Uh, and our friends at the Bureau of Economic and Business Research at the University of Florida uh, said we were at about 313 uh, last year. And according to my estimate, we're at about 319, uh, 319,000 now. Uh, we have about 10% uh, of our population uh, is 65 years and, uh, and over. And our projected population in the city of Orlando is about uh, 430,000 um, in the year 2050. We're a pretty large city in terms of land area, about 119 square miles with uh, conditions that are you know, the, that run the gamut from infill to, to uh, urban to suburban. Um, and of course, we are the central city of the central Florida region. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, uh, the kind of the first major thing that kind of we, we, we worked on in terms of health and planning efforts. Back in the mid to late uh, 2000s, uh, we were involved with uh, something called Get Active Orlando, which was uh, funded by a five-year, $200,000 grant from the Robert, Robert Wood uh, Johnson Foundation. 
And it was actually a partnership um, of, of Active Living by Design initiative, uh, included our downtown, folks from our Paramore Heritage District, which is I'll talk about a little bit more in a, in a few minutes. Uh, we also included our Orange County Health Department, University of Flor Central Florida, Advent Health, Orlando Health, those are our two major hospital systems in Orlando. Uh, the Florida Nur Nurses Association was one of the partners, which is kind of cool. Uh, Metroplan Orlando and the Florida Bicycling Association, and of course, neighborhood residents. Um, so that, uh, we basically started with a survey, um, and uh, it was a survey on uh, regarding our streets and sidewalks and bicycle lanes in the uh, Paramore area. Uh, and we basically created, uh, went about creating uh, opportunities for active living, uh, we instituted a senior walking program, a bicycle refurbishment and giveaway program, community bike riding events, and led a social marketing campaign that emphasized uh, making uh, lifestyle changes. So um, it was uh, really the lessons that we learned out of that one was that uh, that initial assessment data served as a strong platform for policy changes. Uh, it allowed us to create some connections across disciplines, uh, including land use, transportation, public health, and economic development. Uh, and obviously engaging community members was incredibly important, especially uh, the youth and older adults. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the Paramore Conference of Neighborhood Plan was a project that I had the pleasure of being the project manager for back in 2015, 2014, 2015. Uh, and uh, for those that don't know what Paramore is, it's a neighborhood or it's a series of neighborhoods that are just to the west of our central business district. Um, and it's about uh, 800 acres in size, something around that. Uh, around that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the, um, the 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 main thrust of this particular plan uh, was uh, that health is where we live and not a doctor's office. Basically, uh, trying to to marry up uh, health planning and and uh, more holistic planning in terms of transportation, built environment, and social environment as well. Um, we were led uh, by Dr. Richard Jackson, who was a, a pediatrician and also worked for the CDC. Uh, and he actually wrote the book called Health, uh, Planning Healthy Communities. Um, and he uses, uh, next slide please, sorry. Uh, he used a, a series of uh, healthy community design principles and we kind of took those healthy community design principles and and um, made a few adjustments to them primarily in regards to social and environmental justice which was a particularly strong um, uh, uh, factor in the Paramore community which is predominantly african-american and in an area that has a lot of um, uh, issues in regards to poverty and health disparities um, as you can see, if you look at these uh, 10 principles, um, maximizing uh, ability for people to get uh, physical activity, housing opportunities, um, mixed use development, uh, improving access to jobs, investing in people, not in cars, you'll see that there's a lot of overlap between these and the, um, and the eight domains of livability that, uh, that are part of the age-friendly work that we're gonna talk about a little bit more. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, in, the, uh, in the plan itself, uh, one of the action items that was called for was, the, was for us to conduct a, a community health and needs assessment to determine um, the health and wellness status of our residents. Um, and uh, that report was actually uh, done in partnership with our East Central Florida Regional Planning Council and the Florida Department of Health in Orange County in 2020. And that report examined, the, again, our 10 healthy community design principles um, in relation to the social determinants of health, which you've heard a couple times now today. Um, and uh, we think that's, that that report is going to provide us with some really good uh, baseline data for continued longitudinal health and livability studies that we'll uh, be doing. I, I wanted to mention uh, nurses, how nurses got involved in Paramore is my, my recollection is we had a... Um, a uh, group of a, a University, University of Central Florida nursing students that helped us at our very first health uh, fair. And that was our first community engagement uh, work that we did as part of that plan. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our uh, uh, involvement with the uh, H-Friendly Network. Uh, so in, in late 2019, we joined the network. Um, and as a member of the network, we were committed to conducting a community assessment uh, to determine our age friendliness and to develop an action plan based on the findings and, and to implement age friendly initiatives. And we have a steering committee. It's called the Mayor's Committee on Livability and Healthy Aging. And I wanted to point out that uh, in this group of uh, uh, august people, uh, we have two registered nurses, uh, one Gloria Picard, who is uh, retired. Uh, and she was also the uh, uh, executive director for our League of Women Voters here in Central Florida, or Orange County, I'm sorry. And then uh, Dr. Lada Thamwan, who is both a PhD and a registered nurse, a nurse with the University of Central Florida. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, Lada's work in, in a moment. Uh, next slide, please. So where are we? Uh, we are, uh, as I said, uh, we are required to do a uh, conduct a, a survey and listening sessions, and then create. we create a master plan or an action plan, and then we do implementation for several years, and then we do a progress report in year five. So the first draft of our uh, action plan uh, is currently being reviewed internally and, uh, and by our mayor's committee, and we anticipate uh, adoption uh, and, or acceptance uh, in either July or August of this year. So it's, it's fast approaching. Again, as Laura mentioned, we have the we kind of our plan is structured around the built environment and the social environment. Um, next slide, please. And these are just some of the overarching goals of our uh, kind of divided everything up between built environment and social environment. I'm not going to read all these. Um, you can have access, obviously, to this um, to this uh, uh, to this session and. Um, but the action plan itself will have 25 specific goals and 85 specific action items. And I think one of the things I wanted to impart was it's really important for us as planners to, and, 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 uh, and, and, the, and in this action plan, we really view this as a, an equity issue, particularly through uh, an age-friendly lens. So just kind of put that in the back of your mind. Um, next slide, please. So we're, we are cross-pollinating all of our age-friendly action plan work with a number of other uh, things that we've been working on over the, over the last few years. Obviously, our growth management plan and our land development code. Uh, we have a GreenWorks uh, uh, community action plan, which is our sustainability or resiliency plan. We just uh, completed last year Orlando uh, Future Ready City Master Plan, which is kind of your tech technology and kind of future of the city. A parks master plan, which is currently in development, a downtown master plan, currently under development. We already have a complete street strategy and uh, we have a vision zero uh, action plan as well. Um, and then finally, uh, this last item here, I wanted to put a plug in for Metro Plan Orlando, who in January of this year completed their health strategic plan, which uh, we, we see a lot of potential for collaboration between uh, local government and the uh, the uh, uh, MPO on 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 issues regarding health and safety in Orlando. Um, next slide, please. So I wanted to give you a couple of examples, um, uh, some thoughts. Uh, so Grand Avenue Neighborhood Center and Park is a uh, is a is a, is a former uh, elementary school building, uh, historic, that was uh, set to be closed. Uh, the city ended up. Uh, taking ownership of it and about with a $17 million project, we have completely done an adaptive reuse. It is now actually our largest neighborhood center in Orlando um, and uh, they have a new gym gymnasium. But the things I wanted to really uh, ex um, uh, emphasize were uh, the, the park that surrounds uh, the neighborhood center uh, has been improved to include some age-friendly amenities, including playgrounds for children, of different age groups, a musical instrument garden, and ADA accessible all ages exercise equipment uh, with, sh with a shade structure, which is so important in the hot climate, climate here in Orlando. Um, we purposefully uh, place the playground, the musical instrument garden, and adult exercise areas all in close proximity to each other with, uh, uh, with shaded, uh, shaded seating to, uh, to specifically allow parents and grandparents to work, watch their children and grandchildren as they play and as they enjoy the park amenities. And in fact, one of those, uh, we actually added a, uh, 
action item into our age friendly draft, draft age friendly plan. Uh, I won't read all that, but uh, essentially that's the kind of thing that we want to see happen in future park planning projects as we as we go into the future. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to uh, kind of move quickly through this uh, in, or in Lake Nona, which is down in the southeast area of Orlando. We have an autonomous uh, uh, mobility solution uh, in, in that area that, that basically allows for um, uh, an all electric bus fleet uh, running through a, a newly developing area. I'm sorry, I don't have a lot of time to spit, to spend on this because uh, I don't want to, don't want to, uh, make Susan panic uh, as your next presenter. So next slide, please. Uh, again, uh, GreenLink is another example of combining uh, mixed use development, activated civic space and bike facility, uh, bike facilities along with the, uh, the autonomous vehicles all within a stormwater conveyance system. So you can read more about that at your leisure. Uh, next slide, please. Um, H friendly resiliency. Uh, we are we are looking at uh, basically changing our recreation centers to be more like resilience uh, resilience hubs, um, and particularly for communications and for community gardening and that type of good stuff. I'm going to skip to the next slide. Um, and I just wanted to highlight a we were the recipient of a 2021 uh, community challenge grant for our tables of connection project. Uh, it allowed us to uh, purchase and install wheel wheelchair accessible solar uh, operated table and shade structures in two of our, in two of our parks. Um, they're outfitted with Wi-Fi hotspots and charging stations, um, and they're needed. They, they're bringing needed connectivity to two neighborhoods that where 57 and 30 percent, 33 percent of residents uh, lack broadband service. Um, the cool thing about this particular project is we actually had local artists who painted the concrete pads upon which the tables sit, uh, which provides a colorful and unique uh, park amenity. And um, so there you go. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I just wanted to, to uh, since we're talking about nurses on boards, I wanted to provide an example of how uh, that has been an additive value uh, for us. Um, so we have something called the UCF, the University, that's the University of Central Florida Disability Aging and Technology Cluster Initiative. And that is um, a number of different doctors and researchers at UCF that are looking at um, uh, trying to come up with practical, affordable interventions to help people with disabilities and older adults move better and smarter uh, and using technology while also promoting health and well being. Um, so there was an NIH, uh, National Institute of Health, uh, uh, funded fall study. Uh, and one of our one of the members of that initiative, Dr. Lana Thamewan, who I mentioned earlier, and she's one of our members of the Mayor's Committee on Livability and Healthy Aging, has been working with the NIH uh, on technology-based fall risk assessments in low-income older adults in, at the Kinneret Apartments Senior Tower in Orlando. Uh, that initial study, Orlando residents were able to, to reduce their fall risk and improve their quality of life um, and uh, using a pretty affordable intervention that did not, did not require uh, additional or special training. Um, I'm not going to go into too much uh, detail there other than to say that we were, as a city, able to provide letters of support for Dr. Thane Wan's um, uh, grant requests. Uh, both the early one uh, a couple of years ago and the one that she's currently uh, applying for. Uh, and we see that kind of relationship as being very positive for the residents of Orlando. Um, next slide. So um, our relationship so far with uh, the Nurses on Board Coalition, um, we were first introduced to Lori uh, back in 2021 and we had some further conversations with our city clerk. Um, he, she had, our, our clerk, clerk handles all of our advisory boards. Um, in March of this year, uh, we completed the uh, Find a Nurse form, uh, and uh, with that coordination, we we're able to identify 13 nurses in the Orlando area who might be interested. And as of three, as of uh, early uh, uh, earlier this month, three nurses have applied. Um, so uh, we we see the perspective of nurses as being critical in a wide range of topic areas related to health and livability. 
and we look forward to building on this relationship as we be, as we do our age-friendly work. Next slide. Um, I, I mentioned these 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 images. Uh, our livable uh, uh, Orlando action plan is going to feature as as chapter dividers uh, artwork that's created by Arts the Spark participants. Uh, that's a program that's offered by our Orlando Museum of Art for those living with memory or neurological impairments uh, such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Uh, we've also included poems from a uh, from our recent uh, words and wisdom poetry contest in the in the action plan. So we're trying to integrate arts as well into our action plan. Uh, next step, and this is my last slide. Uh, and I just wanted to give an intergovernmental moment of Zen as the Orange County, uh, our, our friends at the Orange County are just starting their age-friendly uh, initiative. Uh, and uh, we wanna make sure that they get lots of people doing their survey. And I will end there. And I think our ne next up is Susan Poplin with uh, Tallahassee. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Susan Poplin. I'm a land use planner with the Tallahassee Leon County Planning Department. And I have a background in policy planning, comprehensive planning, and now age-friendly community planning. And um, I also want to echo some of the other presenters. Uh, what a wonderful panel this is. And appreciate American Planning Association, AARP, and nurses on board supporting and giving such great information. So I'm going to try and continue the discussion about the intersection of planning and our age-friendly communities, health and wellness, and nurses on boards. Um, so you'll notice from the next slide that where we're located is a little different than Orlando or Jacksonville or Miami. A lot of people don't know that we are actually the capital of the state of Florida. And so we're a little bit different. Um, there's kind of an inhale and exhale to our community, and it's caused by a couple of different things. The universities in our community uh, engage a number of students, almost 70,000 students. We have legislators that come to town January through March. And so when they come and go, you see an inhale and exhale of, of population. So I slipped that nurse's term in there, that, uh, that health term. Um, also, we're identified as a place to be educated due to our university culture to have and raise in a family, and also was identified by US News and World Report as one of the top places to retire. We're also locally recruiting through our uh, Choose Tallahassee initiative for retirees to come to us. So it's a perfect place to be an age-friendly community. Now, um, we're not the perfect age-friendly community. We look at it as a way to improve our age-friendliness. So we're getting there. We're not quite there yet. We hope to be, and we hope that through our age-friendly work plan, we can continue to improve. So what I'm gonna talk about today is um, some of our age-related conditions in our Tallahassee Leon County area, and then the um, health and wellness aspects of our community, including our health and wellness domain of our Tallahassee age-friendly work plan. And that includes the relationship of the planning department and our planning documents, like our comprehensive plan, and also planning events and planning activities where we become directly involved in some of those health and wellness activities through our Tallahassee Senior Center, who is our age-friendly coordinator. So actually they're our age-friendly pivot point. And then um, specifically, I'm gonna talk about nurses as part of our age-friendly community efforts, including the community resources we have and the partners on uh, partner boards and committees and their composition, whether or not they have nurses and then the role of nurses on board for existing and future possibilities. So if we can move on, no planning discussion would be complete without a discussion of our population. So as you can see from here in 2010, we had a population of 270 plus thousand and about 26% over the age of 50. So fast forwarding a little bit, if we can go through these and we'll get to 2045. And so what you'll see here is a significant change. We have folks, uh, actually in our community now, we have over, we'll expect over 111,000 people in the, in the 50 plus uh, age group. Ever 300, almost 350,000 people, and that's 32% of our population that will be 
over the age of 50. So moving on, um, when you look at this in 2020, it looks like it's evenly split between our 55 to 64 and 65 to 79. It's about 20 plus percent. And then moving to the next, 24.2 percent and going on, we see that large bar that you see on the screen, 55 to 79, that's our growth. 5.5% per year in that 65 to 79 age group. So we're expecting that trend to, to hold, hold steady, um, and, and then we end up again with more than 30% of our population in that age group. So moving on. So where are these folks? Well, these folks are in our Northeast area and our North, or excuse me, Southeast area. So you look at the census tracts with 1,000 residents age 60 plus, and this is in 2020. And then you look at 30%, that's the hash marked areas. You'll see the red dots are our community service centers for this age group. This map is also one of the reasons that we are planning to locate our new senior center uh, right in the heart of our Northeast Tallahassee area. So we'll move on. So where are we in this age-friendly community? We have actually two designations. One is for our city of Tallahassee, and we are already working on our work plan. We went through a community assessment, a work plan development, and we were implementing as we were developing our work plan. And we are in the progress or assessment stage at this point, getting ready to turn in our assessment on, on how we're doing. What have we accomplished? Uh, what are things we need to work on? I can't say enough about what COVID has done to our health and health and wellness aspects of that age-friendly community work plan. And then um, I got to mention Leon County, they just came into the network, the AARP designated age-friendly community network last year, and they're in the community assessment stage. So they're asking a lot of questions about health and wellness in the community. They're also going to hopefully draw from the city of Tallahassee's efforts to figure out where they are. So looking forward to those things. Now, our network, you'll see Tallahassee Senior Center is sort of number two, but it is our central age-friendly organization for Tallahassee. And then the others on the list are partners or partnerships. It's not exhaustive, but you'll notice that we definitely have relationships with our AARP, our age-friendly community network members, our Capital Coalition on Aging, and our Area Agency on Aging, and Nurses on Board Coalition, which just came to us last year. So if we can go on, and, and I've got to mention, if you had mentioned to me about three years ago whether a land use planner would um, be heavily involved in the health and wellness aspect of the age-friendly community plan with relation to others, I, I may have had a peripheral, I may have said peripherally we might be involved. But now we are a liaison and a central, um, central partnership exists in making sure that we are coordinating on our health and, our health and wellness uh, work plan uh, with our Tallahassee Senior Center. And this is where relationships become very important. We have Ruth Nickens as our Tallahassee Senior Center Health Program Coordinator. She is a nurse and she oversees our health initiatives and programs and she participates in community health events. And I, I'll stop for just a second and tell a story. This is um, actually Ruth and I at the last outdoor event. Um, we did slow roll with a bike, a slow roll ride, bike ride with a with a planner. And then we also participated in the, the springtime senior games. What you don't see is that uh, during this uh, one mile walk, we uh, discussed a lot of things that had to do with our work plan, including the new Greenways and Trails Master Plan and some citizens task force initiatives that Ruth wanted to know about and needed to know about. And in return, she told me about the new resource cards that existed for our Tallahassee Senior Center having to do with referrals, particularly for those suffering from isolation and loneliness during COVID. So if we can move on, I'm gonna, um, skip a little bit about slow road with bike ride, and then we'll go on to, um, let's stop at the Active Living Expo. This was another intersection of the planning department and our age-friendly work plan and Tallahassee Senior Center. 
What you see here is planners attending the Active Living Expo at the Transportation and Health and Wellness section. And we did, it was a twofold or threefold thing. One is we were able to educate about planning and the age-friendly community domains to the participants in the expo. The other thing we were able to do was solicit input about age-friendly communities and particularly to the participants who had, um, had come to the, to the fair to learn about age-friendly communities and to express to us if they had any frustrations. And when you do that, you definitely hear some things. So it was very educational for all of us. Those types of planning activities led to other things like our participation in helping the center uh, maintain their accreditation in scheduling cycling events and also uh, participating in the outdoor symposium that's held every year by the senior center as part of their age family initiatives. So if we can go on. Um, another stopping point I'd like to look at, and, and this has to do with um, transportation, maybe one more over. So this is a key project that was to install wayfinding at the Tallahassee Senior Center. And the, the intersection there is that the age-friendly work plan, the assessment, they identified a significant gap with um, for seniors as far as signage, crosswalks, sidewalks, and, um, and specific roadway improvements. This project pulled all of that together at the Senior Center. So we significantly addressed their gap and also provided uh, something that's going to benefit the whole community, not just the senior center. Um, this was conducted in, in concert with FDOT, which was doing some improvements along our major corridor on uh, North Monroe Street. Um, our underground utilities folks who identified a need at the crosswalk section. Our um, wayfinding staff here, uh, here on staff at the planning department, and of course our age-friendly communities through the senior center. We we collaboratively worked together for this installation, and we've gotten some uh, very good feedback on it. I also wanted to mention that as far as uh, Alex mentioned, the plan for health or planner for health initiative, uh, you can find a lot of information online at the American Planning Association website. There is another case study for a wayfinding project, which um, which is is very good, and I would recommend anybody taking a look at that. Now we think we've done a pretty good job with this one, but uh, there are other resources out there um, for these types of projects. And then uh, I am going to just, uh, if we can skip ahead and move ahead, I'd like to work look at our outdoor spaces. If we can maybe move a little further uh, here. One more back, maybe. Thank oh. <laughs> One more. Um, so I wanted to talk about uh, our uh, involvement in nurses on board and our resources contributing to nursing education. We have some great resources in our community. We have Florida State University School of Nursing, our Florida Agriculture and Mechanical University School of Nursing, which is a historic mm -hmm. black and uh, community, co uh, excuse me, college and, and university or an HBCU, and Tallahassee Community College School of Nursing. These programs are uh, some of the top ranked programs in the state. And we are lucky because we have a, a, a great coming educated workforce. Um, so this is combined with on the next, moving to the next, another uh, whole set of resources contributing to our nursing education in our community. And you'll notice some of the same names, but some additions include our Tallahassee Memorial Hospital, which is our regional hospital and our Capital Regional Medical Center. Um, these are also resources that draw from and are used by our age-friendly uh, age friendly coordinator at the Tallahassee Senior Center. So skipping to the next, we have, uh, you know, as far as nurse practitioners in our community, it's one of the fastest growing occupations in our community. We're expecting a growth of by 54.9% through 2029. It's in the top three in our community. So we have a strong base. And then looking at the next, we see down at the bottom, 22,000 healthcare and social assistance 
employees in our community with an average wage of 52,000. It's a good place to be a nurse or to be in the health field. And moving to the next. So a little about our health network. I, I would have loved to ask a poll question of how many folks thought that their city planners or city planning department would be part of that health network. But we are, and it's a diverse network. And I would add a few lines to this if I could. This was done as a community health assess assessment in 2017 by the Health Planning Council of Northeast Florida. I would draw additional lines to our senior center and also to a number of city and county departments, which are now directly involved in a lot of our age-friendly uh, initiatives. And I would also include AARP and our local nurses on board. So one of the things that, um, that we started out with were different than Orlando. We have, we have had to ask ourselves some questions about nurses on our board. And so we, did an, we had to do an inventory and we felt like the inventory needed to start with our direct partners. And I give all the credit to the Tallahassee Senior Center, which, which uh, assisted and did this survey. So if we flip to the next, we see, do we have nurses on your board of directors? And these are our direct partners for our age-friendly communities and the Tallahassee Senior Center. And most encouragingly, we see a number of them do already have nurses or either retired or practicing nurses on board. But it also made us ask a few more questions. If we can go to the next. Do you have any other healthcare providers on your board of directors? And we, we encouragingly also saw this. We have pathologists, psychologists, therapists, marriage and family therapists, internal geriatric and hospice physicians. So this was very encouraging. And then um, finally, and we have one more. Would your organization benefit by having a nurse on your board? And if so, how? And so we got some really good feedback on this. Um, again, very encouraging. Uh, we didn't get any no's. We got um, mostly yeses and some maybes. So there's opportunity. If we can go to the next. So one of the things you should consider if you're looking at this is what your mission of your board or committee is. Does it have a specified, it doesn't necessarily need to be age and health and wellness related, but could a nurse benefit by giving their perspective? Their activity level, do they meet once a month? Do they meet sooner, more? And then the appointment level required, some are just administrative appointments, others require city or county commission action to appoint and maybe even have a list of specific uh, participants that have to be met. So those are all things to keep in consideration. And then I'll leave you with uh, on the next, so other collaboratively identified boards and committees, and so we see these as potential possibilities for community planners. Um, could we look at uh, could we look at these boards and committees? Here's our uh, wish list, if you will, and uh, that's where I think nurses on board can really assist us. I understand from nurses on board that they already have some pre-registered nurses in our area that may or may not be willing to serve in a capacity on some of these boards. So we're very excited about the future. Uh, and I'll leave these possibilities with you as community planners and turn it back over to Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, and before we uh, open up for any questions, I wanted to ask a poll question. If now that you've heard this presentation and you've heard about the nurses on board opportunities, are any of you thinking or interested or considering reaching out to nurses on board to get a nurse on a local committee or board? So if you could take a second, and then once this poll is closed, we'll open it up quickly. We have a little bit of time left for questions. Wonderful. So go ahead and uh, take a stab at that response here, and uh, we'll see if we can't get a couple questions in here. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close our poll and then share the results. So are you now interested in reaching out to nurses on board to find nurses in your area to serve on a committee or board? So 44% say yes, 41% uh, say I don't know, and 15% say no. So that's, that's where we're at. Um, if everyone wants to go ahead and turn their webcams back on, 
uh, we're going to jump right into questions here. So this first one is for Laura. Um, if Laura, if you're around, uh, where does public transportation fit into age-friendly communities? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, that's one thing that we talk about a lot under the transportation umbrella is making sure that we have multiple choices and options, uh, particularly here in Florida. Uh, a lot of times when people turn in their keys, uh, there aren't a lot of options. So yeah, that's one of the things that we're focusing on with this work is to see what type of choices are available. Great, thank you. Um, Laura, this one is also for you. Uh, this is a, a good setup question. Uh, Money Magazine and, and other types of magazines that, that do rankings uh, rank the best uh, living livable cities nationwide. Does AARP have such a ranking mechanism with regard to livable communities? We do. We have our livability <laughs> index that I mentioned earlier. Uh, you can go to actually with our refresh that we did last month, we ranked uh, the communities that scored the highest based on population size. So you can go and look for metro, suburban, urban, rural, and see how they stack up. Great. And I also, in that chat box, um, I did include a link to uh, the AARP website, um, the livable communities portion. Uh, of the AARP website. So folks, you can copy that over to get all that information. All right, wonderful. Uh, this next question is for Paul. All right, so what what is the city of Orlando doing to address homeless uh, encampments, particularly in their physical relation to parks and safety and uh, community members uh, uh, feeling safe enough to utilize the city of Orlando's park system. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll back up and say I'm not the homeless coordinator for the city of Orlando. Having said that, uh, it is probably uh, we we had a discussion about this with our uh, with our Florida group uh, this morning um, about this very same subject. Uh, it is it is probably the the toughest. Uh, public policy issue that any uh, local government has to deal with. Um, the uh, city of Orlando uh, really focuses on a housing first approach, which is to, uh, and that we have a, a, a coordinator out of the uh, out of Mayor Buddy Dyer's uh, office that is uh, uh, that works through with all the different service providers in Orlando. To try to 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 work on that issue, uh, we have obviously we've all been seeing with the tough economic times, we've been seeing some increased activity in terms of homelessness. I think the uh, the idea is is to try to ensure that we provide the wraparound services that folks need, um, and working with the partners. There's in or in Orlando, we have several different organizations that uh, that work on this: the uh, Coalition for the Homeless of Central Florida. Uh, Christian Service Center uh, in, uh, in in downtown, and the Salvation Army all offer really great programs in in in, uh, in the Orlando area. It's it's a tough one. I'm not sure if I have all the answers, and I'm not sure that any local government has all the answers. Um, but we keep trying. And and one thing I would say that in the age friendly work, I think it's important to realize that we're all getting older and we need to take care of each other. That's the kind of the philosophy that we take. Wonderful, and I think we have to close there. Uh, there are still some great questions, so if folks want to reach out directly to our panelists, feel free to do so. Uh, they seem like friendly folks and seem like they would love to help you all out. Uh, so just a couple reminders, head over to our website, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast, and there you will be able to um, get a copy of today's presentation as a PDF. There'll also be a list, uh, a bio a, a bio list of all of our panelists today with their information and also um, that uh, the, sh the nurses sheet that, that Lori talked about, that is also on our website. You'll also be, you'll see a link to log your CM credits and then probably sometime Monday morning, there will be a link to a recording of this session. So that's all of that information, plus the ability to register for all of our upcoming sessions. Again, is on our website, ohioplanning.com. 
cmu.org slash planning webcast. Don't forget to log your CM credits. Thank you, APA Florida and um, this great group of folks working on their uh, plan for health, planners plan for health initiative. Um, this is some great work. Uh, you know, when, when this program came about, you know, years, several years ago, APA Ohio also participated in the plan for health program. And it's, and it's nice to see that there's still chapters that are working on it. And, you know, it just hasn't dropped off because it's just a great collaborative effort of folks, you know, cross partnership. So thanks to you all uh, for joining us today. Everyone have a great weekend and we will talk next time. Have a good one. <laughs> Bye everybody. Bye.